people, O oh God, lead us in your way of peace. With grateful hearts, we prepare to receive God's word for us today. Our Father, we give you thanks for the privilege of worship. We ask that your spirit touch our hearts, make the air electric with energy. Open each of us to the power of the gospel. May each of us grow in faith as we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, spirit, spirit of gentleness. One moment. Uh, we're going to take a technical break because I did not have it up as I thought I did. So my apologize, apologies, friends, we'll be with you in one moment. I'm so sorry. One moment. I think I've never done this before. My apologies, friends. Wind, wind on 
That was a beautiful hymn, and it was the tone was just perfect on it. We could hear it crystal clear. So I thank you very much, Allie. Well, we thank the Reverend Emily Zyg Lindsay, who taught me how to find the computer audio on a Mac. I really like that hymn. Prayer of Confession. Almighty God, you poured your spirit upon gathered disciples. Creating bold tongues, open ears. And a new community of faith. We confess that we hold back the force of your spirit among us. We do not listen for your word of grace. We do not speak the good news of your love. Or live as a people made one in Christ. Have mercy on us, O God. Transform our timid lives by the power of your spirit. And fill us with a flaming desire to be your faithful people. Doing your will for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the good news is that all of us are forgiven but for the asking of our faith. And now we get to the junior sermon, and I hope I have a whole bunch of you out there, and I think I do, and that's wonderful. You know, I just delight in the young people of the church. They just make worship so good, and young people make my life better. There's nothing more wonderful for a preacher than having young people in the church. Good morning. Pardon? Good morning. Morning, morning, good morning. Good morning. That was a bunch of hunter children saying good morning to you. Well, that's wonderful. That makes me happy. I love to hear that. Glad to hear you guys. Love you. Uh, this is Pentecost Sunday, and it is a great celebration in the church. You know, there are many different dates on the calendar that a Christian church uses. For us, the calendar begins not January 1st, but the first Sunday of Advent, which this year will be the last Sunday of November. And the week before is Christ the King Sunday. But really in the church, there are three particular things that we really celebrate big time. The first is Christmas Sunday. Oh, I love Christmas. I love Christmas Eve service, and I was so thrilled when the young people were in church to be part of that last Christmas Eve. To me, it is so wonderful when the high school young person brings in the Christ candle and looks at me and says, Christ is born and pass it on. And then we say it to everybody in the church has their candle lit. And the second great celebration of the church is Easter Sunday. And oh, what a wonderful time that is. Christmas is the birth of Christ. Easter Sunday is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, where he comes back as living Lord and Savior. And I always love to listen to the Alleluia Chorus. It stirs my faith. It has the ability to put awe in my heart. And the third great celebration of the church is what we celebrate today. Pentecost Sunday. That's the birthday of the church. I know all of you young people love it on your birthday. It's always so much fun when you get up and you say, today is my birthday. I am now another year older. And you enjoy it and you have fun with your family and with your friends. Well, it's good news, but the church also has a birthday. And the birthday is Pentecost Sunday. And what happened on that day was the Spirit of God was given to the church. And you know, it was an awful noisy day. It was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. And there were tongues of flame that landed on the people. And people had the ability to be able to communicate with each other. And it was a promise that God was going to bless the church and God was going to keep the church. I think the most exciting day for me in ministry was the day I was ordained. And I only remember two things that were said on that day. I remember that the executive presbyter said, Harry, 
you will never forget the date of your ordination. And that is true. I will never forget the date of my ordination. And the second thing, a dear friend of mine, Jack Winnett, who had been my boss one year when I had chaplaincy at Rayland and Glen Robbins, he was a pastor assigned to me from the old Steubenville Presbytery. And he, we gave me the charge. And he said, Harry, I want you to pray for the spirit of God. Because if you have the spirit, you're going to be able to make the air electric with energy. I still use that phrase. I didn't realize it, but I wrote the bullet and I used it a little bit earlier in the prayer of confession. To make the air electric with energy. In other words, to make the spirit of God in the church excited. And that's why we celebrate Pentecost. Because it's the birth of the church and because God has blessed it and he makes all life exciting thank you so much for being here and now we move to the morning prayer friends you can go ahead and unmute your, mute yourself if you're on the telephone by hitting star six and uh if you have any prayer requests please lift them up i do see a number in the chat section um, i'll lift those up to you too for those who are on the telephone um, Good news about Wilma Ferguson. She is really improving this week. She uh, expects to be in rehab another week, but is doing much better. Uh, Dad, what is the name of the rehab center she's in? It's the one that is connected with um, the hospital in Meadville. Okay. So the name. That, I, just know where it is. I just know where it is. Okay, Google the rehab center with Meadville Hospital um, to be able to find an address to send her a card. That might be nice. Uh, we also continue to pray for her great-granddaughter Mia in Pittsburgh. She did have surgery on her lung this week to remove a tumor and is expecting to have uh, more surgery uh, in the next few weeks to remove tumor that's on her kidney. But we pray for little Mia. I believe she's just six years old. So we pray for that sweet child that is going through the unimaginable. We rejoice that Lawrence McGranahan is home um, and uh, he really wants to be up and at him. Uh, fortunately, he has a good caretaker who is also his watchdog to make sure he doesn't do too much. And so we have prayers of joy for Lawrence and um, prayers for uh, energy for both he and Norma as they navigate this recuperation together. We also pray for Jim uh, Sosbury, who will be um, dealing with the anniversary of his beloved Barb's death. It'll be four years since um, Bob Barb joined the church triumphant. Uh, we also have in the chat box uh, to remember that it was today, 35 years ago of the great tornado outbreak that hit Northwestern Pennsylvania. And it just knocked Albion right out, or not Albion, um, not Albion, but also Albion. Yeah, Albion, I remember that very well. I was a fifth grader at the time, if that tells you anything. That would have been the spring. Um, I guess it was spring of 85. I was thinking it was spring of 86, but it's spring of 85. We also um, celebrate with Lori Buchanan, her sister Leanna's graduation from uh, Cash. It's coming up on Tuesday. She's one of the co -sal salutatorians. Um, so second in her class, and she is going to the I an Ivy League school. I believe it's Yale in the fall. Is that correct? And the church has a present for her that we're going to deliver to her. Yes. And um, Terry, are you on here? We still pray for your mom and dad. Do you have an update on how they're doing? They're about the same. And it's just sad. Uh, mom is getting more depressed and um, dad is getting weaker. Yeah. Uh, for you. those of you who don't know, Terry's dad has severe dementia. Mm -hmm. And uh, so her mom and dad live uh, in a retirement community. And I, Yeah, I, it's called Tapestry. It's in Moon Township. Moon Township. So as you imagine, uh, for our senior citizens who are living in um, 
retirement communities, their restrictions are really great. Um, they can't have any visitors and many of us are sheltering in place anyway, but um, it's even more restrictive. So um, we pray for Alice and Bob, but all the other seniors in our community who are experiencing a great deal of loneliness too because of this. Are there any other prayer concerns today? Just trying to look down my chat to see if I missed any. Okay, Let it, of course, um, I also want you to pray for the Reverend David Mumford, who served uh, as pastor of Luther Memorial Church in Erie, Pennsylvania for decades. Um, he was the pastor of the church when I went to uh, school, grade school at Luther Memorial Learning Center, a uh, friend and colleague of my father's. He uh, has a virus. It's not been said whether it's COVID, but he is fighting for his life right now with a virus. And so we pray for Pastor Mumford, who's been a significant uh, clergyman in the Erie area. And of course, we pray for our sisters and brothers of color who put uh, a name to what is their everyday experience with the death of George Floyd, um, with Mr. Cooper in the park in New York City's Central Park, trying to be just bird watching. Um, and the countless deaths and threats that um, people of color experience every day. So we lift those in our prayer too, as we gather together for prayer on this Pentecost day. Let us pray. Spirit of God, wash over us, still us, cleanse us, renew us. Give us hope. Give us strength and wisdom. Help us to gain greater emotional intelligence that we can help break down barriers that divide, that we can help Reduce the level of stress by being cognizant of mindful of how others are feeling by helping to de-escalate tragic and hard situations. Lord, we pray for our country this day. One, as we mark over 100,000 deaths from this COVID virus. And we pray for our world, knowing that there are countless beyond who have also died from this disease. We remember their families and pray for strength as they grieve. And Lord, we pray for this nation that exists with systemic racism that is so pervasive that at times as white people, we don't fully acknowledge or recognize the privilege we live with, but what is ordinary to us can be threatening to our brothers and sisters every day. Lord, we pray for your justice to roll down. We pray for healing for this nation. We pray for equity. We live into the hope of what our great founders set out for, for liberty and justice for all, recognizing it has not always been a reality and we have more to work toward as a nation and as people of the world. Lord, help us to dismantle racism. Help us to lift up what the greater story is and not the violence. Change the hearts of those who act in violence and may the voices of those working nonviolently for change be lifted higher above so your real goals and purposes will be heard. 
Lord, this day we pray for our church family too. We pray for Wilma and Lawrence's continued healing. We pray for sweet Mia, for her little body to be able to be strong and resilient, for the doctors and nurses and all who work with her to really find a cure for this child. Be with her parents and all who love her as they seek to provide support to that family. Give them energy to navigate these days. May your light shine upon them. Be with Pastor David Mumford as he is fighting for his life. Be with Jim this week as he mem fully memorializes his wife with his family. Give him strength as he navigates these days because grieving is still hard. Help him to celebrate all his wonderful memories with this awesome lady. Lord, we remember back 35 years ago to that tornado outbreak. Kali, there have been so many across this country in that time, but that's when it hit home to our region. We pray for all who experience tornadoes, for recovery, for hope, for a community that responds. And Lord, in these strange days, we have high school kids and college students graduating, folks finishing graduate degrees. They're strange days, they're not able to celebrate as they normally would, but we rejoice with Liana for her hard work and good accomplishments to claim co-salutatorian. We pray for her future ahead and for that of all 2020 graduates. There will be stories to tell but help them navigate the days ahead and find pathways by which they can learn and grow and be even formed more fully into the beautiful young adults you have made them. Lord, we pray for our church, our church, which is still open and active in ministry, though the doors may be closed. May your spirit be upon the session as they continue to notice and claim ways they can serve you in Adamsville. Give them energy, imagination, and love. Be with the trustees and those who help to manage the property. Give them great capacity too. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Our first lesson comes today from the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verses 24 through 30. So Moses went out and told the people the Lord's words. He assembled 70 men from the people's elders and placed them around the tent. The Lord descended in a cloud, spoke to him, and took some of the spirit that was on him and placed it on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But only this once. Two men had remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the second named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they hadn't gone out to the tent, so they prophesied in the camp. 
a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, Nun's son, and Moses' assistant since his youth responded, My master, Moses, stop them. Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? If only all the Lord's people were prophets with the Lord placing his spirit on them, Moses and Israel's elders were assembled in the camp. The word of our Lord. Thanks. Be That's to you. a nice passage. Thank you. I'm preaching a sermon on Pentecost today, but with all of the things that have occurred this week, I do need to make a statement and it's from my heart. I would certainly call it a think it over because it is no more than that. It is a challenge to make you think about the situation that we're currently facing. There are two catastrophes that are hounding America today. The first is a pandemic, the coronavirus. 100,000 people have already died in the United States from this disease, and we have absolutely no idea how many people will die before the disease finally takes its course. And there's a second horrible, horrible issue facing the people of the United States. And that issue is racism. We cannot make an excuse for George Floyd's death. In my judgment, after having watched the video, the only thing it can be described as is murder. Unfortunately, this is not the first time this has happened in the black community. I understand a portion of the rage of the black community, but I cannot understand at all where I stand in the shoes of a white man. There is such a thing as white privilege. I never have sought white privilege, I've never wanted it. But it's something I and everybody just like me has received. You know, for a number of years, I was on the executive committee of the Synod of the Trinity, which meant four times a year, I would go to Harrisburg for several days each time. And I met and became a very close friend of a wonderful black lady that was about my age. She was a retired school teacher. And we always sought each other out because we did have an awful lot in common and we became tremendous friends one to the other. There's times she shared with me stories of her past, how there have been moments when she's been absolutely terrified because of the prejudice that was thrown upon her. And she was able to give me exact details of those events. And also, she talked of how so many times she was humiliated. I've also seen this in my son-in-law, who is a black man, a person our whole family loves, Kevin Young. Wherever we see racism, as Christians, we should inherently know that it is always wrong. And of course, it's also true that it's wrong to burn down a nation. The question is, how do we respond to anger with something that is not increased anger, with increased wrath and with increased revenge? The question is, how do we keep something like this from becoming a matter of the political right or the political left? Today, we celebrate the giving of the Holy Spirit of God to the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to refer to something way back in the Old Testament. You remember the story of the Tower of Babel? The Tower of Babel had one purpose. It was to divide the languages of the human race and to tear people apart. Pentecost has a goal that is totally different than that. Pentecost is to unite the languages. And the purpose of Pentecost is to bring people together. In this very hard time that scares me, I suggest it's a time for humility. It's a time for gentleness. 
It's a time for patience. It's a time for love. It's a time for prayer. It's a time to listen to responsible people on all sides. I was a young man back in the 60s, and this began to occur before my ordination. In 1966 and 67, cities all across the country were on fire. And there were some wonderful pastors in Pittsburgh. One was a black gentleman that everybody honored, Leroy Patrick. And these men, every night, walked the streets of the ghetto, talking with people, calming them down, asking them to find a way to bring change without destroying their lives and the lives of the nation. I would say, thank God for Leroy Patrick. The city of Pittsburgh did not burn. What we need as we handle this, and it's not going to be finished tonight or tomorrow night, we'll probably be dealing with this all summer and for years to come. But I believe that we need a lot less rhetoric, we need a lot more reason, and we need a fantastic amount of prayer. And maybe if we do that, somehow when everything's said and done, we will have a nation that heals itself, we will have people who respect and who love each other, we will have peace, and we will have goodwill among God's children. For the scripture, I'm reading the Pentecost account, which is found in the second chapter of the book of Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent mighty wind, and it filled the entire house with tongues as of fire, and a tongue rested on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they said, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each of us hear in our own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and all parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others suggested that they were filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed. These are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it will be God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in heaven above and signs on the earth below. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today we are celebrating the birthday of the church. Just as on the 4th of July, we celebrate the birth of our nation. So on this day, we celebrate the church's birthday. 
the first thing we do usually when a person has a birthday is to thank God for that particular individual. I know many times when my children have had a birthday, I've privately to myself, Lord, thank you for giving them strength and health. Thank you for letting them be among us. Well, I want to suggest to you today that it might also be a good thing just to take a second to give thanks to God for the birthday of the church. When a person has a birthday, there's always a certain amount of looking back. We look back not only to the date of our birth, but to the place of birth. I was born in Crafton, a little suburb of Pittsburgh. And we look back to the community in which we were born. And usually we also look forward through the years. We try to see our lives as they are now. And we wonder, what will the future belong to us? Very important questions. We should probably do the same thing when we celebrate the birthday of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, almost 2,000 years ago, a small congregation of 120 people met in an upper room. They came together to worship and to praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, in the book of Acts, the Spirit of God is presented as sudden. The Spirit of God is presented as quite noisy. And the Spirit of God is presented as terrifying. It's flashing, and there are great manifestations accompanying the entrance of the Spirit. Now, in modern times, Quakers have attempted to tame all of this down. They have presented the Spirit kind of as a gentle, quiet, moving breath. Much like the hymn we're going to sing in just a little bit, Breathe on me, O breath of God. Our age is much more violent. We can prove that by just looking at what's happened to our own country in the past five days. You know, Palestine in the first century was a very violent place to live. They had all kinds of rebellions and they had a whole number of assassinations going on. Let's look at what occurred. First, there was the sound of a mighty rushing wind. I would suggest to you that wind can be terrifying. Now, I don't know how loud the noise was. I wasn't there. But I'm absolutely convinced that it was terrifying. The noise was loud enough to fill the entire house. And the next phenomenon was this. There appeared to be tongues divided as of fire. And it came down on each of them. The idea is that they have new tongues, and now they speak new languages from the, which they had never spoken before. The word tongue here means language. Maybe this is kind of a combination of a natural event and a supernatural event. I kind of believe it is. But at any rate, these wonderful people that made up that first church were on that day filled with the Holy Spirit of God and they began to speak in other tongues. In the Old Testament passage we read this morning, the 70 elders were filled with the Holy Spirit. Of course, some of the people complained about this, but Moses was absolutely delighted that people beside himself had the Holy Spirit of God. Here, the Holy Spirit is in solemn connection with the great feast of the people. Now, in verse five of the second chapter of the book of Acts, the apostle is brought in, and with him come the 11 disciples, plus people from all of the nations that were gathered in Jerusalem at that time. These people were devout, they were confused because each was hearing in their own tongue. To make that simple and understandable, I've always called this a United Nations miracle. 
You know, if you're in the United Nations and you're giving a speech, there's somebody that immediately translates what you say through a microphone to whatever delegate it is that is listening in the language of the, what the dialogue is speaking. At any rate, there were a huge number of nations present. And many of the people weren't in the home, they were out in the street. You couldn't have fit that many people into the upper room. And people from the outside that were hearing and seeing all of this were amazed and they wondered, are these not Galileans who are speaking? We have astonishment, we have ecstasy, and we have perplexity. This happens often whenever it is we're talking about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some said, these people are drunk. They're filled with new wine. And this isn't unusual either. It's always been characteristic of unbelievers to bring charges against religious people. Now, when I think of enthusiasm, I think basically there can be three different types of enthusiasm. One is emotional. Another would be a theological enthusiasm where you have a strong attachment to a particular theological concept. And the third would be ethical determinism. The decision that you are going to do right, no matter what. And the author was trying to convince everyone that from the Holy Spirit, the power of God now was available. And this received the jeers of people from the outside. Now here's something I think is very important. In the midst of all of this, Peter speaks out. The last time he was identified as a Galilean, he denied that he ever in his entire life knew Jesus. He even used cuss words. Now, Peter, Peter stands before the assembled people, and he no longer hides. He no longer sinks into obscurity. He no longer denies the Lord Jesus Christ. He and the 11 apostles stand with him, and Peter begins to speak. And his power was absolutely awesome. He was inspired that day. I would call this divine strength. Peter then says, let this be known to you. These men are not drunk. I guess I would raise the question, is this a sound defense? It seemed to be satisfactory to his audience. And it is true, drinkers usually do start later in the day. Even today, you rarely see whole groups of people drunk at 9 a.m. And Peter says the giving of the Spirit was predicted by the prophet Joel. And he quotes from Joel, the second chapter, verses 12 through 14. I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. This was originally when Joel spoke it, a call to repentance. Israel had sinned. Israel needed to return to God. This is kind of the way it worked in the Old Testament. Try to visualize it if you could. The prophet looked toward the people and said, you sin. This is the word of the Lord. And then the prophet would turn and he would face the other direction. He would face God. And he would take the people's petitions to God. This was part of the prophetic function. Then the prophet would turn to the people and he would say, this is the word of the Lord. Here Peter is saying, this is the real meaning of Joel's prophecy. The day of fulfillment right now has arrived. How do you know that Peter is right? I guess you just have to believe the Holy Spirit of God was present that day, and the Holy Spirit of God literally touched the prophet. No, a prophet does not understand all of the elements of his or her prediction. 
the prophet only understands the meaning to their own generation. When Joel spoke those words, he did not envision Jesus and he certainly had no concept of what the Roman Empire would become. All he did was receive a message from God and he had the courage to speak that message. Then a later prophet would come along and that prophet would say, the words now have been fulfilled. And this is what we have in the book of Acts. Peter says that the Holy Spirit of God somehow managed to open up his heart, his mind, and his brains. The prophecy has now been fulfilled. So we have two things. On the one side is the prophet who spoke for his generation. And on the other side, we have the Spirit of God in an entirely different age touching a second prophet. And if you look back to the good Hebrew people, you find that this is Pesher. You must have insight to be able to make the prophecy the first time. And you have to make, have insight to interpret it in a later period. Now notice in the New Testament, it says that the Holy Spirit's given to a lot more than the 70 elders and the two other people that were still in the camp. The Holy Spirit of God is given to all flesh. I created a doctrine an awful long time ago. Maybe uh, Terry and Jane remember it. I've used it now for pretty close to 50 years. I like to talk about retrojected eschatology. Now, when young people join the church, I tease them because I'm a tease at heart. I also let them know from the first I'm not going to flunk anybody. But they always have to appear before a session. And I tell them on that first day, I'm going to ask you some real tough questions. Every one of you are going to have to explain in detail to session the doctrine of retrojected eschatology. And just to be a little bit of a devil, sometimes the first question I would ask when the kids would meet with session, I'd look at somebody and say, hey, Terry, what's the doctrine of retrojected eschatology? But, you know, the word retrojected would be used in the space industry. Uh, rocket is retrojected. It is far back. Now, eschatology is the doctrine of the last things. I made the term up, but it is a very, very true piece of theology. Because you see, I believe that when you believe in Jesus, you have the future thrown back into the present moment. Peter is telling the good people the age of fulfillment has dawned. Eschatology, the doctrine of the final things, really has been fired back to the present moment. For Jesus Christ is raised. Jesus Christ is here. The last times are now. In other words, we know that we're saved. Eschatology has been fired back to the present moment. Now, the world may be here for several million more years. Last week, if you remember, I preached that passage from the first chapter of Acts. It said, it's not for us to know the times or the seasons, but we are to go to Samaria and Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you see, the important fact is, we are saved right now, but for the asking of our faith. If I am with a dying person, and I am many, many times every year because of my hospice ministry, I find it very comforting to be able to look at a human being and say, you don't have to worry. I can guarantee to you that you are saved. You have both a future and a hope. And this is what Pentecost is all about. This is the great reversal. You killed Jesus, but God raised him up. The idea, right now, we have divine forgiveness. Please know that Pentecost is for you. God loves you, and God has called you to service. Thank God for the birthday of the church. Now, one other little fact 
and I'm done. Later on in the chapter, it says that 3,000 people were converted that day. In my mind, I think Peter must have been absolutely ecstatic. Because I know I thank God for one convert. You give me one person to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I'm ecstatic for an entire week. At any rate, hold on to Pentecost. Enjoy Pentecost. It's God's gift to you. It's God's presence in your life through his Holy Spirit. Ellie? Muted. Thank you. Uh, we come to the time where we offer ourselves, our time, talent, and resource. Uh, I know this last week, uh, Jean put out uh, coolers at the basement door of the church where people could share basic things like canned food, um, beans, peanut butter, pasta. Um, other good things might be shampoo and toilet paper for those who really are living on the edge these days, they might need a good bar of soap. Those are easy, non-perishable items that you can put in those coolers to really support those in the Adamsville community who might need it. Jean, have you been, seen any use? Have you been able to get over there and see if it's taken advantage of? I've been there. Uh, there's quite a bit of stuff, so I don't know whether anybody's used it or whether or if people are just filling it as fast as it's getting used, so I don't know. But we've moved it to uh, just inside the doors upstairs, so the coolers are out of the weather, but yet people still have access to them. Perfect, very good. Um, anything else you folks are doing with your time, your talent, and your resource? I think if you could uh, take the time to uh, write to Wilma and maybe we can get an address for Mia as well. And golly, Lawrence probably would like some good luck keep recuperating at home cards too. So um, maybe that's one way to share your time. Think about others who are in the community who might be lonely, still sheltering in this place. Even um, does Crawford County move to Green this week on Friday? Yeah, they were our, they moved to green this past Friday. Okay, but even in the green zone, a lot of our uh, community may be at risk folks who don't wanna go out yet. So taking the time to check in on them, to be with them and support them is really key. So that's another way we can share time, talent and resource. Remember, the church is not closed. The church is still being the church. We're here worshiping together. We still have Christian education going on. I know my dad is reaching out, making calls to church members to check in. And I trust that you're making calls to one another. Uh, but uh, our building is closed, but we are still the church. So let's celebrate what it is to be the church. Continue to put our thinking caps on on ways we can uh, share God's hope, God's light, God's justice in the world, provide healing to those who need it, um, and really think of our near neighbors who might need the support right now too. Um, so to do that, though the church is closed, they still have a post office box. So if you want to share support by mailing a check, going uh, to the church website at EmsvillePresbyterianChurch.org, or going to the Give Plus app to make a gift, or simply logging on to your own online bill pay on your banking account. You can do that and simply press Adamsville Presbyterian Church, PO Box 56, I believe it is, Adamsville, PA, and the church will get a paper check. But we are grateful for you sharing your time, talent, and resource, and joining us and putting our thinking caps on for ways we can really um, be of support and relevant ministry uh, in the Adamsville community. Let us pray. Holy God, you have gifted us. You have provided your sufficiency to the world, though it's not evenly distributed. And in the midst of this pandemic, as so many are out of work, so many who are back to work, but dependent upon 
commission, and it's just not happening, are fearful of the future, are wondering how to make bills meet, pay bills to make ends meet. Lord, we offer our gifts of time, talent, and resource and pray that we can share what we have so that your good news will be heard, so that healing will be occur. You taught us the basics, offering a cool cup of water to someone who's thirsty. Continue to open our eyes and may these gifts of time, talent, and resource we share really be used for your sake. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we go to our last hymn, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. And I thought I had it up, so let me look. I don't know where it went. One second. My apologies. Thank you for bearing with me, friends, today. I'm having a hard time for some reason. Okay, take my coffee out. I'm going to try this one more time, friends. And as we wait for me to pull up this music, remember, we'll have coffee hour where we'll turn off my recording and we'll be able to join together for coffee hour very shortly. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you now and in the life everlasting. Amen.